A core doctrine in the Christian faith is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we do with our lives while we're waiting for that? And are there things that we can do to prepare ourselves for his return? Those important questions we're going to talk about today. Joining me is Reagan Rose. He's the founder of Redeeming Productivity, a ministry which helps Christians develop a biblically grounded understanding of personal productivity so that they can get more done for the glory of God. He's received his MDiv from the Master's Seminary and uh, formerly served as Director of Digital Platforms for Grace to You, the media ministry of John MacArthur. And he's written a new book titled Well Done, A Strategy for Life Stewardship. Reagan, thanks so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. When we think of stewardship, most minds naturally go toward money management, and that's certainly true, but you're going way beyond that. What do you mean by life stewardship? Well, if a steward just means someone who's been charged with taking care of something that belongs to another person, which that is what it means, then if we step back and think, well, what have I been charged with taking care of that doesn't belong to me? We find in scripture that it's our entire life, right? First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, you're not your own, for you were bought with a price. And so this idea of stewardship doesn't just apply to our finances. I think we rightly apply it to all of our lives, viewing it as a trust that's been given to us that we need to invest well so that we might glorify God. Now, what prompted you to begin writing on stewardship? You obviously worked on, you got your MDiv from the Master's Seminary. What led you into this particular focus of your work? Well, I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing on the subject of personal productivity. How do you think about that from a Christian worldview? Mm -hmm. And I just found in those studies and writing on it, I just constantly came back to stewardship over and over again as just one of the best sort of holistic lenses for looking at the Christian life and, and trying to be faithful in it. Um, and in fact, some years ago, I, I came across a quote from Randy Alcorn, where he said, stewardship is not a subcategory of the Christian life. Stewardship is the Christian life. And, and I really kind of took that and ran with it. And that was what prompted the book was me trying to explore that idea. How, what if we think about the Christian life through this stewardship lens and really, really dig into that imagery that scripture gives us? Reagan, where did you begin uh, looking into this and, and developing sort of your idea of how you would teach stewardship? Well, naturally, I turned to Matthew 25 and the, the parable of the talents, you know, where the, the three servants, the master entrusts the three servants with differing amounts while he goes away on a journey. And so throughout the book, I... I kind of take that parable and take different sections of it and try to really dig into what each of them means and how we can mm -hmm. apply that to different areas of our lives. What were some of the things that, that really just jumped out at you when you began to digging into the Word of God and, and, and looking at stewardship and what Jesus was teaching? What are the things that really stood out to you uh, that you hadn't noticed before? Yeah, one of the big ones was I did a lot of historical study on what a steward was in the ancient world and how mm. someone would be entrusted with household management. Often it was a, a slave or a servant in the household who was given this really high duty. Even in the Old Testament, you think of Joseph in the house of Potiphar. He, he was kind of that role where they're almost part of the family. And that was very surprising to me to really see that there is a... Uh, um, a respect there's a there's an affection for the stewards it's not just that they're servants they've been given this really high duty because they're entrusted with it because the master is trusting them and so there there's a there's a great affection there between the master and the stewards just as there is with between Christ and his disciples so that was a big one um another one you know which I'd thought about before but really digging into it further intrigued me was the varying amounts entrusted to the servants, right? So one, he gives five talents, one, he gets three, one, he gives one. And just how crucial it is to our understanding of our own faithfulness. I think there's a big temptation sometimes for believers to feel like, well, I'm not gifted like so-and-so. I'm not a great mm -hmm. speaker. I'm, I'm not on the, the front lines of Christian ministry. And to use that, we can use that as an excuse to sort of sit on the sidelines. But no, the, the idea of stewardship is, it, it's about taking what's been entrusted to you and being as faithful as you can with it. What is your interpretation of the portion of that parable where Jesus takes the one talent that the man hid in a handkerchief and gives it to the man who had 10 talents? What are we to learn from that? 
Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with heavenly reward. Um, th this is an area that I think we underemphasize sometimes in the evangelical world because we're we're trying to be so cautious, as we should be cautious about any kind of suggestion or implying or, or someone misconstruing our words to think that we're saying that works add to the gospel, that you have to to work to earn uh, entry into heaven. And that's, of course, not what the parable says. It's not what the scriptures teach. But we do find throughout the New Testament that there is a promise of additional reward, heavenly reward for faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things you see in the in the parable is the the different stewards, the faithful ones, are rewarded, and that even the uh, the steward who was unfaithful, part of his reward, part of his trust, is given as as part of the reward to the uh, faithful, the most faithful uh, steward in there. And so I think a lot of it ties back to that idea of it, it, God is is not just saving us; He's in and saying, "Hey, you know." Uh, just hang out here on earth until I come back. <laughs> yeah. But he's saying, "Hey, get get to work. Do this. Be faithful. Because guess what? I'm I'm going to be faithful to my promises, and I'm a rewarder of those who serve me um, out of love for me." Well, wow, that's good. Your book, Well Done, A Strategy for Life Stewardship, is divided into two main sections. The first is the call to stewardship, and then the practice of stewardship. Would you give us an overview of those? Sure. So in the first section, it really is just going very deep, verse by verse, through the parable of the talents. And so we talk about the charge of stewardship, this idea that this is not an, an optional call. This isn't like a, a, a two-tier Christianity that some people take seriously, the call to be stewards, and some don't. No, this is a call for all disciples of Jesus. Um, we look at the content of it. What is a talent, right? They're entrusted mm -hmm. with these talents, which are a type of money. And I think that's why Sometimes we we go wrong thinking, oh, this is only about money. No, it's it's a parable. The money represents the the thing that's been entrusted to them. Um, we look at the compass of stewardship. So I take Genesis to Revelation, all of what does the Bible teach about stewardship? And we find that even at the very start of creation, God entrusted us with the care of this earth and, and that this stretches on into when Christ returns. And so this idea of being stewards is not an isolated metaphor that Jesus uses in one parable, but really is part and parcel about of what we've been called to do in this life. We look also at the character of it. So what makes, what are the marks of a faithful steward? And then, and then finally in that section, the compensation. So that idea of reward, I kind of touched on a little bit. How are we to think about this as, as Christians? What is this reward? What does that represent? And how does that play out uh, in eternity? Um, and then the, the second part, part two is more practical. And I just, I tackled the three kind of the phrase you hear a lot of times is we're to steward our time, talents, and treasure. And so that's what I go into. How does this apply to how you manage your time? How does this apply to your gifts, your natural gifts and your spiritual gifts? How do you invest those? And then of course, treasure, how does, how do you take this and actually apply it to your finances? Because that certainly is an aspect of stewardship. Reagan, is motive a part of what Jesus will judge believers for as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you could you can look at two uh, people that are doing the same work, and they might do basically the same thing. But man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that is part of what he takes into account. And even you find in the parable, the unfaithful steward when he's confronted by the master, he's like, why, why'd you just bury the money? Why didn't you invest it? Mm -hmm. And you find his heart because he, he turns, he says, because you're, I knew you were a wicked master and you, you reap where you don't sow. And you're like, whoa, what is all this? And sometimes believers, you're reading that and you get caught off guard. Like, why is this guy so angry? It's because that confrontation actually revealed what was in his heart. The reason he wasn't faithful was because he hated the master. Mm -hmm. Well, and the reason often even, you know, just to get, uh, convictional with with ourselves, the reason we fail to steward our lives as well as we ought to comes down to this hard issue of, do I trust the Lord? Do I love the Lord? And ultimately, that's part of what he what he judges in us and, and wants for us is to, to serve him from the heart. It seems like there's been a de-emphasis on the return of Christ in a lot of evangelical circles. How has that shift impacted the way that we tend to look at stewardship? Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's very interesting, I think, to note how often that was discussed. Even I grew up in the church mm -hmm. as a child, 
And you just don't hear people talk about the return of Christ, or if they do, there's almost an embarrassment about it. Um, if I were to kind of venture a guess, I think a big part of it is the within the church, there's sort of different uh, eschatologies, different visions right. of the end times have sort of uh, crept in, and so they compete, and there's sometimes a little bit of an embarrassment or a fear of wanting to you know, cause a controversy uh, by bringing up the return of Christ. And so I think that's a big thing. But I also think that there's always been this heart issue. Even if, if you stretch out a little bit and you look at, you know, Matthew 24 and 25, this is, you know, the parable takes place in there, but there's several parables in the Olivet Discourse is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And they all have to do with this idea of watchfulness. Mm -hmm. Even the parable of the talents, it's under this idea of we're to be watchful for he's returning soon, right? Matthew 24, be on the alert for you do not know which day the Lord is coming, right? It compares it yeah. to the suddenness of a flood, like in Noah's day, a thief breaking the night. All this idea of watchfulness, there's a reason Jesus had to warn us to be watchful because our tendency is not to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we may be experiencing a, a lull right now, a sort of sleepiness, you might say, in the evangelical church, where we're not as on guard. We're not thinking as much about, no, he could return any day. And that should be our watchword. That should be what keeps us awake and keeps us saying, okay, so I have today, so I'm going to work while it's day. I'm going to serve him today because he could return any moment, and I'm going to treat that seriously. Reagan, what are some first steps uh, to begin practicing good life stewardship? If someone is listening and they are really, really identifying and resonating with what you're saying, how would you advise a good first step uh, to look like? I'd say two things. I'd say first, you have to focus on the heart, just like we were talking about a minute ago. Uh Stewardship comes from the heart. God doesn't just, he doesn't need us. He invites us into this and he wants us to serve him from the heart. So get close to Jesus, you know, learn to love his law, spend time in his words, spend time in prayer, invest yourself in a local church. Those will actually kindle your desire in your heart to want to serve him. Mm. And then you start to move on. You sort of layer on top of that. Let's get practical. I, I like just very practically making a plan of attack. Uh, one thing um, I, I teach is this thing, I call it a, a well done a statement, where you basically you write down some of the key areas of your life. Maybe it's your relationships, your, your, maybe you're a student, your work, all these different things. And you try to define what would faithfulness look like in each of these areas in the eyes of Christ mm -hmm. at the end of my life. And then once you write that down, you ask the hard question, okay, which ones am I falling short on? And when you do that, then you can sort of get strategic. You say, wow, I'm really not being a good steward of my physical health. Let me deliberately and out of a desire to glorify God, make a plan of attack to, to manage my time, to manage my eating or whatever it is, right? You can apply this to any area and, and actually get it out of just the spiritual concept of, oh, I want to try to do better and bring it down to, okay, let's make a plan for how we can actually do that in his power and for his glory. Very good. Once again, the website is redeemingproductivity.com. And the book that we've been talking about is his new book, Well Done, A Strategy for Life Stewardship. Great topic, uh, great information, and great encouragement. Uh, Reagan, thank you so much for being with us here on The Stand Radio today. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> 